Good morning, little nerds. I am Dr. Shireen Idris. Welcome to my YouTube channel. We are about to take off into space. I have also locked myself in my bathroom so that my kids and my husband would not come in and interrupt our Pillow Talk Derm session. We do this every Saturday morning where we debunk skincare myths, we talk about beauty trends, and we dive in deep into different ingredient stories. So if you've never joined, welcome. You are now officially a nerd. And if you are smart, you will subscribe to this channel and like this video and let me know what you want to learn about next. So I have seen every comment. I have read every question. I have seen the amount of myths and misinformation surrounding retinols is mind boggling. So today we are going to debunk the six most common myths that I've seen online with you so that you guys don't fall into the fear trap and you are better educated and more empowered to know how to use these products in your routine and on your skin. Number one, perpetuated by doctors, by estheticians, by experts, and it needs to die. It just needs to die. Those retinols thinning out your skin is not right. Retinols do not thin out your skin. Let us dive in deeper and understand why people think retinols thin out your skin. They assume that if your skin is flaking or shedding or just falling off your face, it is naturally going to get thinner. But they're forgetting that our bodies are equipped to actually produce new skin cells. In fact, your skin naturally regenerates itself every 28 days or so. It goes through a skin differentiating cycle where from the lowest layer of your epidermis, the skin cells work their way up, shed in a natural process, and newer cells regenerate and come back up. This is happening on its own. But as we age, as we become wiser, as we become finer like wine, that process gets a little bit slowed down. Retinols, retinoids, that vitamin A class of ingredients can help our skin cells differentiate better in a much more effective manner. That being said, it's normal in the early weeks of using a retinoid in your routine that your skin can be a little bit flaky, can be a little bit dry, can be a little bit peely, but that doesn't mean that your skin is getting thinner. However, and I'll put a little however, if your skin is always red, inflamed, irritated while using a retinol, even after several weeks, maybe retinols are not for you or you just went too strong and you were wrong, all right? Wrong and strong is sometimes good in life, but not necessarily when it comes to your face. So your skin actually is not getting thinned out. It is just renewing itself much more efficiently. And the other thing to know about retinols, and this is where this particular myth needs to die and I, why I use it as number one, retinols themselves, as it helps to accelerate this process, does trigger and actually triggers positively a skin cell known as fibroblasts lower down in the dermis. And fibroblasts are responsible for creating and secreting collagen. And so retinols have been shown to actually produce collagen over time by being a positive influence on fibroblasts. The other second thing that is not as well known about retinols is that it blocks collagenase. Collagenase is an enzyme that everybody has that causes the breakdown of collagen. By minimizing the activity of collagenase, you are minimizing the breakdown of already very precious collagen in your face. I'm here to tell you, tune down the noise. It is noise, it is not fact. Number two, retinol exfoliates your skin. And I thought this was a very smooth segue because we talked about retinols making your skin flake, making your skin peel. So people then think, oh, peel, exfoliation. It's an exfoliant. Retinols are exfoliating your skin. No, they're not. Retinols do not exfoliate your skin, okay? They just don't exfoliate your skin. Retinols, and I am actually mistaken by calling them retinols. We should just all be calling them retinoids, but everybody calls them retinols. It's like the anti-aging thing. It's my own personal struggle. I just had to vent and confess. But retinols or retinoids are vitamin A derivatives, okay? Exfoliating acids are not vitamin A derivatives. So what the hell does that mean? You didn't tell me anything. No, I did not. Exfoliating acids dissolve the bonds that hold your skin cells together. If you have skin cells that are stuck together, right, right here, right, 
Exfoliating acids are going to dissolve this bond, poof, allowing that to fall off. And that is working at the top layer of your skin. Retinoids, like I just mentioned, are actually causing your skin cells to accelerate and to differentiate in a more effective manner, but they're not causing your skin cells to fall off your face. It is allowing for that whole cycle to happen more effectively. The function might sound the same, but they are doing two very different things. And therefore, to say that a retinoid is like an exfoliating acid that is exfoliating your face is really, truly false. And you will be doing yourself a disservice if you believe that. If you guys want to learn more about exfoliating acids, I will link them below. I just did a YouTube video um, talking about glycolic acid versus salicylic acid and going into that science. Which leads me to myth number three. You cannot use a retinol with an exfoliating acid because you will burn your face off. And this one, I will say that I might be guilty of also perpetuating because what I've come to realize is that sometimes you have to present information in a very simplistic manner for people to understand the basics. And once they understand their skin, you can dive in deeper into the details. But the reality is you can absolutely incorporate an exfoliating acid on the same night that you use a retinoid. But this is not for the beginners out there. This is for the real vets, the ones who know their skin, the ones who are already used to the retinols, the ones who do not have sensitive skin. Because if you incorporate them both on the same night and you're brand new to the process, it is going to be a little bit irritating for your face because then you're going to be incorporating two irritating ingredients at once. But the reality is once you know where you stand and you know how you respond, you can absolutely incorporate both at once and you're actually going to see potentially better results over time as long as you do not get irritated or inflamed. That is always the golden part of this discussion, the actual asterisk that should not be overlooked because you're going to allow for the retinoids to work more effectively on your skin because that dead noise on the superficial aspect of your skin would have been taken off and you don't need to actually go through that in order for the retinol or the retinoid to work its magic. When in doubt, don't sweat it, just alternate the nights. So if you're gonna exfoliate on average three times a week at night, because I do prefer exfoliating at night, on the other four nights, use your retinol, okay? That is basically my best rule of thumb because ideally you do not want to exfoliate every night. And if it's hard for you to keep track of which night you're doing which, just alternate them. Monday exfoliation, Tuesday retinol, Wednesday exfoliation, Thursday retinol, Friday exfoliation, Saturday retinol, and Sunday, you can either drop it all and just kind of moisturize or use a retinol. All right, myth number four. What else do people say we cannot mix with retinol? And this one always boils down to vitamin C. This is one that people love to act like they are chemists and they're like, oh, well, it's the pH of the vitamin C and the retinol are going to like, you know, counterbalance one another and they're not gonna work. This is one of the biggest disservices that you can do for your skin because the combination of vitamin C and a retinol can actually be chef's kiss and work wonders for your skin. But again, you have to understand what you're using on your skin and why this myth started. The myth started again because the biggest concern was irritation. Vitamin C can be irritating, but what people are not explaining is that they're talking about the active form of vitamin C, L-ascorbic acid, which is the one that people classically think of as skinceuticals, right? Or timeless, the one in the dropper or the one in the pump. L-ascorbic acid is the active form of vitamin C and the most irritating form of vitamin C. When you combine that with an irritating ingredient, whether it is an exfoliating acid or a retinol or whatever it is, it's gonna have the potential of being slightly more irritating together. And if you are sensitive, you probably do not wanna combine the two. The other misconception about vitamin C and retinol is pH, and that's what I meant by the chemist. Everybody wants to act like a chemist. Vitamin Cs are often formulated at a lower pH. They are obviously acidic, whereas retinols are usually formulated at a higher pH. And the idea is if you put both of them at the same time on your skin, they're not functioning at the right pHs and they're not gonna work and they're gonna work less effectively. The reality is most skincare products when applied to the skin reaches the skin's equilibrium in terms of pH pretty fast. So so the pH of one product is not going to really alter the pH of another product. But the bigger reality is, and the reason why this really bothers me, is that vitamin C is not vitamin C across the board. This is where formulation matters. And if you're really going to act like a chemist, 
go in deeper. There are different forms of vitamin C. They're not all active. L-ascorbic is pretty much the only active form. You have ester forms of vitamin C that are much more stable and unlikely to get affected by pH. This is why, personally, shameless plug, in my own skincare line, in Active Seal, I used the form known as tetrahexyl decyl ascorbate, which is the ester form of vitamin C. I combine this every night when I use my retinol, and I think the effects are much better for it because you're combining an antioxidant with something that is going to cause your skin to turn over slightly faster, and you wanna protect it from any sort of inflammatory response that you might get from that retinol as well. So you're getting double benefits by combining a certain type of vitamin C with your retinol. For you guys to be scared when somebody says, don't combine your vitamin C with retinol, ask yourself, number one, what type of vitamin C? Number two, is it because they're talking about people with sensitive skin? Number three, are they using it directly at the same time, like a vitamin C and a retinol together on their face? Highly unlikely. And number four, when you're talking about a skincare routine, there are several steps. You're usually buffering, putting a moisturizer. So you're probably putting the vitamin C, some other serum, maybe a moisturizer, and then a retinol. And even if you're using the vitamin C, serum, retinol, moisturizer, there's another product in between. And let's just say you're using the active form of vitamin C first, you're probably waiting a second before you apply the retinol. So I don't think that it all holds true and you should kind of dig in deeper to understand this one better. And this leads me to myth number five, a lot of people think you have to keep working your way up when you're using an over-the-counter retinol, when you're using a retinol, when you're using tretinoin, which is the prescription. Everybody's always trying to go stronger. More, 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 more. That's not true. Getting your face blasted with a super strong tretinoin is gonna cause you way more harm in the long run than trying to use, for example, an over-the-counter retinol, which is maybe mid-percentage every single night for 20 years. I bet you, and I know this for a fact, that the person who's using the lighter concentration of a retinol much more consistently over time is gonna see way more benefit for their skin than the person who's using the really high one once a month because their face gets so inflamed in the process. Concentration is not everything. But when it comes to retinoids and retinols, it is extremely important that you as a consumer understand the type that you are using as well as the concentration that you are using. Because so many patients come to me on a daily basis telling me they cannot tolerate any form of retinoid. But the reality is they haven't even tried. They've literally just tried prescription and told me they can't tolerate it and they back off. But they haven't tried the least aggressive form, right? like a retinol ester, and they haven't tried the least potent concentration, which is the lowest concentration. When you're thinking of over-the-counter retinols, right, it usually starts around 0.25% up to 1.0. When you're talking about prescription, tretinoin, right, the lowest percentage is usually 0.01 to 0.025%. And the highest is 0.1%. So just to give you guys an idea that a 0.1% tretinoin is much stronger than a 1.0 retinol over the counter, but a 1.0 retinol over the counter is the strongest that you will find in terms of retinols. So the number itself doesn't mean everything, but the number related to the type of retinoid means everything. Did you guys follow me on that one? And if you didn't, please leave the questions below. Maybe we'll do a deep dive about retinoids, retinols, and percentages and strengths. Let me know below because this is one that I really want you guys to understand because it will help you so much when it comes to your skincare journey and how you guys are aging and how you're taking care of your skin. And last, myth number six. This is one which is very interesting about you using retinols around your eyes. And it is a misconception. However, recently there were two articles that came out, one in the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Ophthalmology and one in the Journal of Ophthalmology, where they say and they show that using any sort of retinol around your eye is going to increase your risk of getting dry eye disease. But there's several issues with these two articles. Number one, dry eye disease is, I'm not an ophthalmologist, right? This is the beyond the scope of my level of expertise, but dry eye disease is multifactorial. Many things lead to dry eye disease. Dry eye disease is due to our meibomian glands within our eyelids, which are the glands that secrete sebaceous oils, right? Oily substances that help to protect our eyes from evaporating our tears, keeping our eyes lubricated. They naturally get smaller over time. 
number one. So naturally over time, we all become predisposed to getting dry eye disease, number two. Number three, several other factors can also contribute to dry eye disease that are part of life, including contact lens wearing. I've been wearing contact lenses since I was 12 years old. I finally had surgery last April, and because of my long-term contact lens use, I knew I had my Bohmian gland disease or dry eye disease because I've been using contacts for so long. So then to say the retinols are causing it is gonna confuse consumers because many other factors come into play. And number four, being long-term on antihistamines, being long-term on allergy medications can also, also unfortunately contribute to dry eye disease. I take Allegra every day because I have seasonal allergies in the spring and in the fall. So I know this from first-hand basis. The other reason why I think the studies were a little bit flawed, although I do not doubt them, because the reason I do not doubt them is when you take oral isotretinoin, which is the oral form of tretinoin, right, Accutane, people complain of dry eyes all the time. We know that systemically it can dry you out. If you're applying your tretinoin, which is the most potent form, not retinol, not over-the-counter retinol, on your eyes, it can get seeped into your eyelids and affect your meibomian glands. But as a dermatologist and somebody who focuses on cosmetics, I am not telling you to apply the tretinoin on your eyelids, right here where your meibomian glands are. This is not where you should be applying your tretinoin because you'll get irritated, your eyes will get flaky, and you will hate your life where you do apply your tretinoin is actually on the bony part of your eye right here. Don't get too close, like I said. You do not want to be on your lower eyelid. You want to be on the bony part of your lower eyelid right here where your skin marries your eyelid, okay? Or your cheek marries your eyelid. And the other thing that I always tell patients when they are using retinols around their eyes is buffer it. Put Vaseline first and then use the smallest amount of a retinoid around your eye. Allowing that buffering to happen is gonna make the tretinoin less effective, which is kind of what you want because it's a very sensitive area. Now, if you're like, why am I using a prescription then? Ding, 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 ding. You can absolutely use an over-the-counter at its lowest percentage around your eye, even without buffering, but your skin can still be very sensitive. So to be safe, I always say just put Vaseline and then use it or look for eye creams that are formulated with a retinol for the eyes because those tend to be less aggressive and they're formulated to deliver the actual active in a gentler way around your eyes. Eye creams with actives are very useful. Eye creams without actives, not so useful. Personally for me, I used to have a lot of lines under my eyes. My mom gave me a La Prairie eye cream when I was like 12 or 14 years old and I had the worst allergic reaction. Over time, I have been using retinols around my eyes and I've done microneedling and I've done PRP. Those are the three things that I've been doing for my eyes and I'm nearly 40 years old and they have worked miracles because I don't see as many fine lines as I used to and they used to be much deeper. You can ask my mom. Things that you hear are not always true. If you really wanna know the things that are true about retinols, don't use them here. Most people cannot tolerate them here, including yours truly, and you will always kind of shed like a snake. The neck and the chest are much more sensitive, so don't think you can just extend down when it comes to retinols. You have to use a moisturizer first and use a much less percentage when it comes to the neck and the chest. If you are pregnant, do not use a retinol. That is absolutely true. It's not worth the risk. Oral form, isotretinoin, is a category X, right? immediate kind of abortion, unfortunately, if you take it and you get pregnant. So because this is the derivative of that, when applied topically, depending on the surface area that you're applying it, how much of it gets absorbed and while you're pregnant is just kind of an unknown that we just do not need to discover together. So it's just best to avoid it while you're pregnant. However, when you're breastfeeding, knock yourself out. And retinol does make your skin more sun sensitive. So always, always, always follow it up with sunscreen if you're living somewhere very sunny, very hot, closer to the equator. But that doesn't mean that you cannot use retinol all in the summer. It just means you got to be smarter about how you protect yourself against the sun. Hope you guys truly enjoyed it and let me know below if you have any questions or comments or concerns or whatever it is and we will address them next time. All right, have a beautiful Saturday. I'm off to space. See you guys later.